Previously, we discussed why the modeling of atoms is a super important problem. In this video, we're going to describe how this is traditionally done. When we think about objects and we think about how they interact, a lot of times we think about things like, you know, the moon orbiting around the Earth. So let's start off by talking about gravity. The potential energy due to the gravitational force is highest when the objects are far apart. As the objects move closer together, the potential energy decreases. If we look at the force, which is essentially the derivative of the potential energy, we see that initially the forces are quite small. But as the objects move closer, the forces increase until they eventually collide. Now if we look at the interaction between two atoms, it's quite different. Just like gravity, the potential energy is quite high when the atoms are far apart, and as they move closer together, the potential energy decreases. However, unlike gravity, as the atoms move even closer together, the potential energy increases and then shoots straight up. Now if we look at the forces, initially they're quite small when the atoms are far apart, but then the forces increase as the atoms move closer together, but then again fall off. And as you can see here, the atoms are quite happy, sitting a certain distance from each other. If we push the atoms even closer together, then we see really strong repulsive forces. The reason why the forces and the potential energy behave in this way is the interaction between the electrons and the protons in the two atoms. So let's look at how the interaction of the electrons and protons impacts the arrangement of atoms and molecules. If we look at this carbon dioxide molecule, CO2, we see what we'd expect, kind of intuitively. A carbon atom sits in the middle, and two oxygen atoms are evenly spaced on either side. Now if we look at a water molecule, intuitively we think that there would be a oxygen in the middle with two hydrogen atoms on either side. But this isn't the case. Why is this? Well, it turns out that an oxygen atom in a water molecule wants to have four different sets of electrons on its outer shell. So how do we distribute four points evenly in 3D space? Well, the answer is a tetrahedron. So two vertices on the tetrahedron are occupied by two pairs of electrons from the oxygen atom, and the other two vertices are occupied by electrons from both a hydrogen atom and the oxygen atom. And this gives us the familiar shape of Mickey Mouse ears for a water molecule. So how do we model the interaction of atoms? How do we figure out their arrangement? The way this is done is we have an initial arrangement of atoms, and then we compute the forces on the atoms. We then update the atom positions, and then repeat this process, computing the forces, updating the atom positions, computing the forces, etc. The forces are computed by taking the derivative of the overall system's energy with respect to the atom positions. So the trick is, how do we compute the energy? One way we can compute the energy is to use something called density functional theory, or DFT. Now DFT takes as input the 3D atom positions and their atomic numbers, and then does a bunch of calculations and then produces the overall system energy and the per atom forces. You could treat DFT as a black box, but I'm going to go into some of the mathematics behind DFT, so that way you can gain an understanding for how DFT works and why it's so computationally expensive. One way that we can compute the energy is to use the Schrodinger equation. It has a form of h times psi is equal to e times psi, where e is the energy. Now this equation takes the form of an eigenvalue problem. In an eigenvalue problem, we have a matrix A that we take as input, and then we want to calculate the eigenvector x and the eigenvalue lambda. Now going back to the Schrodinger equation, we have H, which is a Hamiltonian, which takes as input the 3D positions of the atom's nuclei and its electrons, and it computes the interaction between them. We have psi, which is a wave function, and the main property you need to know about the wave function is that if you take the square of its norm, that's equal to the electron density which is a probability of seeing an electron at a certain position r. And then finally we have the energy E, which is the overall energy of the system. It looks like this equation should be fairly easy to solve for, but let's look at a practical problem. Let's say we have, you know, 100 platinum atoms. So that's 100 atoms times 78 electrons, and each exists in 3D space. So how many dimensions is that? Well, it's over 23,000. Even if an analytic solution existed, it'd be too computationally expensive to solve. So let's take a step back and look at our problem again. So when we think about atoms, so we think about diagrams like this. We have a nucleus in the middle, and then a bunch of electrons on the outside. And you might think the electrons kind of orbit around the nucleus. But the first thing you should know is that when you think about protons and electrons, usually we might think of them as being equal in size. It turns out that protons are actually 2,000 times bigger than electrons. 
So putting this back in, the right way to think about an atom is you have a large nucleus with a bunch of little electrons kind of whizzing around. And these electrons move a lot faster because, well, they're a lot lighter. Going back to the Schrodinger equation, we represented the electrons using three n different variables, where n is the number of electrons. Instead of modeling each electron independently, we can model them in aggregate using their density, which is a function of three variables. This reduction in the number of variables will have a significant impact, as we'll see. The density of the electrons is actually quite interesting. Here's a few examples just from a hydrogen atom. So this brings us to the approach that we discussed earlier, called density functional theory, or DFT. Where density refers to the electron density, functional refers to a function of the function representing the electron density, and theory, well, it's a theory. The foundation of DFT rests on two theorems proven by Hohenberg and Cohn. The first theorem states that the electron density uniquely determines the energy. This means we don't need to know the exact position of every single electron, we just need to know their overall density. The second theorem states that the electron density, which minimizes the energy, is the true density. This leads us to an iterative approach to compute the overall system's energy. First, we pick an initial electron density. Then we calculate the wave functions given the electron density, and then we calculate the electron density given the wave functions. We then check to see if the electron density changed from the last iteration. If it did, we compute the electron density once again. If not, we're done. Looking at all these different steps, there's one that is computationally much more expensive, and that's calculating the wave function. So let's dive into that. To solve for the wave functions, we use the cone sham equation. And this looks a lot like the Schrodinger equation that we saw earlier. The difference is we consider each electron i independently given the overall electron density. The psi i's are wave functions for a single electron, which are typically referred to as orbitals, and e is the energy. Now let's look at the terms we have on the left-hand side of the equation. We have the electron velocity, followed by three different potentials. We have the electron and nuclei interaction. We have the electron and electron density interaction. So note here, we're not modeling the interaction at every pair of electrons, just each electron and the overall electron density. And this is where the computational savings come in. And then finally, we have the exchange correlation potential. And this models quantum mechanical effects and a bunch of other things. It's kind of like a kitchen sink potential. Now one thing to note is that the three terms on the left are all known. We know how to calculate these. However, the exchange correlation functional, we don't. That is unknown. There's been a lot of different potentials proposed, like LDA or BPE, and they're each good for different applications, you know, different materials, different molecules. So if somebody asks you which potential you used for DFT, this is what you're talking about. Finally, the overall running time of DFT is order n cubed, where n is the number of electrons. If you're interested in learning more about DFT, check out this book. It's the best resource I've seen for learning more about the fundamentals and mathematics behind DFT. And the first version of the book is online for free, there's PDFs out there, check it out. How long does DFT take to run in practice? Well, if you only have about 10 atoms, it's going to take minutes. If you have 100 atoms, it's going to take hours. If you have 500 atoms, it could take days. And if you have thousands of atoms, it's going to be weeks or might not even converge. So this is why we generally don't see people using DFT for problems like studying nanoparticles, which might have up to a million atoms. And this is why for problems like protein folding, where you might have 10,000 or even over 100,000 different atoms, we're generally not modeling these problems at the atomic level. So let's take a step back and look at how the energy and forces computed by DFT are typically used. The quantities computed by DFT can be used for many different purposes, but there are two that are most popular. The first is a relaxation. Here we compute the forces on the atoms and we update the atom positions and we keep repeating this until the atom positions converge to a local energy minimum. The second is something called molecular dynamics. And you can think of this as simulating what happens to the atoms when we add heat to the system. So the atoms basically just keep wiggling and jiggling around. So whether we're doing relaxations or molecular dynamics, this is going to take hundreds or even thousands of DFT calls. This is going to take days or weeks of compute. So how can we get these calculations down to seconds? Well, one way to do this is to use machine learning. So how can we represent this problem using ML? Well, we have a bunch of nuclei and we have a bunch of electrons all whizzing around. So how are we going to model the electrons? Well, the answer is, we're not. We're just going to use the same inputs as what DFT uses, the 3D positions of the nuclei of the atoms, and their atomic numbers. And then we're going to calculate the overall system energy and the forces on each atom. 
While we don't model the electrons or their density explicitly, we hope that the models will learn how the atoms interact. So that's it for this video. We covered how we traditionally model the interaction of atoms and why it's so computationally expensive. We touched on how we can use machine learning to speed up these calculations, but we'll have more on that later. Next, we're going to be talking about catalysis and why catalysts are important, how they work in chemical reactions, and how we model them.